Hi, this is Joe Polish uh, from Genius Network, and I love marketing.com. And you're about to, uh, in a moment, watch me interview Mr. Bob Berg, the author of The, the Go Giver, uh, Go Givers Sell More, which is this fancy green book here, and Endless Referrals. And so here's his formal introduction, the only part of this that I'll be reading. Uh, Bob Berg shares information on topics vital to the success of today's business person. He speaks for corporations and associations internationally, including Fortune 500 companies and numerous direct sales organizations. Bob regularly addresses audience, audiences ranging in size from 50 to 16,000, sharing the platform with notables including top thought leaders, broadcast personalities, Olympic athletes, and political leaders, including cabinet secretaries and a former United States president. For years, he was best known for his book, Endless Referrals, Network Your Everyday Contacts into Sales, which has sold well over 200,000 copies and is still going strong. His national bestseller, co-authored with John David Mann, is entitled The Go-Giver, a business parable that both touches hearts and builds bigger bank accounts. It shot to number six on the Wall Street Journal business bestseller list just three weeks after its release and reached number nine on Business Week. It's also Bob's fourth book to the to top the 150,000 mark in sales. He and his co-author John David Mann recently released their newest book, Go Givers Sell More, uh, which takes the five laws contained in their previous books and relates them specifically to the selling process. Bob is an advocate, supporter, and defender of the free enterprise system, which I will ask him and talk to him about, believing that the amount of money one makes is directly proportional to how many people they serve. A lover of animals, he is a past member of the Board of Directors for Safe Harbor, which is the Humane Society of, of Jupiter, Florida. So I recommend, uh, while you're watching this, grab a notepad, because Bob will deliver tremendous value, as he does in his books, and I think you're going to learn a lot. So welcome me as I now interview Bob Berg. Hi, this is Joe Polish, and I'm here with Bob Berg. Hey, dude, thanks for coming here and spending time. This is going to be awesome. Joe, I am honored. Thank you for yeah. having me. Look so forward to I mean. The, the book, The Go-Giver, I first heard of this from my friend Cameron Johnson, who sent me a copy a few yeah, years ago, okay. and the, the book has just done amazingly well, and yeah. right from the get-go, I mean, you've, you've written The Go-Giver, you've written Endless Referrals, uh, your latest book is uh, Go-Givers uh, Sell More, you've done this with your co-author, John David Mann, and uh, yeah, I just need to ask you, what exactly is a go-giver? What does that even mean? Well, a go-giver is someone who has learned to shift their focus. Mm -hmm. uh, they've learned that shifting their focus from getting to giving, in this case meaning constantly and consistently adding value to people's lives, mm -hmm. is not only a nice way to live life, it's a very financially profitable way as well. Gotcha. Well, first off, we had a great conversation just you know in the last hour about your thoughts on selling, uh, capitalism, uh, creating value, difference between value and price. And I'm going to ask you some questions about all those sure. topics. Uh, I would love to have you define um, capitalism because I think we very much share some of the beliefs that capitalism sure. is the, the, the greatest process in the world for uh, you know making the world a better place and creating value. Absolutely. In, in every country where capitalism, truly understood and defined, is allowed to reign supreme, uh, the standard of living for everyone, everyone goes up significantly. Mm -hmm. The poor in a capitalistic society is much better off than the poor in a more socialistic, less free society. Uh, we uh, in the U.S. have been sliding down the path to socialism over the last 75 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, slowly but surely, which is kind of how it, how it happens. Uh, capitalism defined is really nothing more than the free exchange of products and services between two or more willing parties. Uh, it means that, that government's um, responsibility is to protect people from force and fraud. Other than that, it's to create the environment where people can truly create and exchange. Yeah. So, I mean, why do you think uh, why do you think business owners and entrepreneurs and salespeople get a bad rap? I mean, what is going on? Well, the first thing is, you know, when Ayn Rand once said that even the greatest logic, if based on a false premise, will always lead to an incorrect conclusion. And so often, capitalism is not correctly defined. For for example. Uh, even when, when Michael Moore had that movie come out, uh, I think a couple of years ago, Capitalism, A Love Story. Right. And I didn't see the movie, and I didn't have to. I've read enough of them. Uh, I've read enough, and I've seen enough, and I saw the previews, and it was exactly in there what I thought it was going to be. 
he was not talking about capitalism. Oh yeah, I saw the movie, and that movie has nothing, nothing to, do to do with, with capitalism. capitalism. He was talking about corporatism, yeah. which is absolutely not capitalism at all. Uh, when major corporations or special interests are buying the influence of our of our Congress people in order to have special rules, laws, and legislation that's made in their behalf and to benefit them, there is nothing capitalistic about that. But if you were to call that capitalism, of course, you'd say, oh, well, it doesn't work because, but it's not capitalism. Right. And so Michael Moore, while he may be well-intended, I don't know him, I don't know what he's thinking, I don't know what's in his heart, while he may or may not be well-intended, I think it's the moral responsibility of somebody like Moore who has so many people following him and accepting his ideas just at the surface level, I think he needs to become more educated about what he is, what it is that he's slamming. Exactly. Yeah, you know, because I've heard the term, you know, from Dan Sullivan that, you know, the only thing wrong with capitalism is, is that it was named by its enemies and that capitalism in its purest form is collaboration between individuals exchanging That's money for value or trade for value. Uh, but, sure. but it's really what you are all about. I mean, it's what your message is about. It's, it's the way you, you operate is is that what you get in life is a result to what you give to other people, sure. the value you create. So that, mm -hmm. that's what I want to talk with you about today, because uh, the, the people that would be watching this uh, are predominantly entrepreneurs, but there are also people that are out there that could be working in jobs and positions where their income is a result of, va of the results mm -hmm. that they create for other people, the value they create exactly. for other people. And you, you basically teach people how to be more effective uh, doing that. Uh, and, and so... Uh, in your book, uh, Go Give or Sell More, you actually talk about the where the term selling mm -hmm. came from. So can you give us a little bit of historical background about this subject called selling that we're going to get into? Sure. Well, you know, John David Mann, my, my awesome co-author, and, you know, with the original book, The Go Giver, which is a, a fictional story, mm -hmm. and with Go Give or Sell More, and John was the real storyteller for the Go Giver. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a how-to person. Right. I'm step one, <laughs> step two, step three. Uh, to, to write a fictional story is, is well beyond my abilities. Uh -huh. And I, I asked John to be the, the lead storyteller. And fortunately, he said yes, because he's so brilliant at what he does. And when we did Go Giver Sell More, which is a little bit more of an application base to the Go Giver story and the five laws, the first thing we wanted to do was, again, set the premise. What is selling? If we're talking about Go Givers Sell More, yeah. we need to know what we're saying. And the, the readers need to know what we mean by selling. And we believe that most people have selling backwards. Now, this would be okay if it was just the consumer who had selling backwards because then a good professional salesperson could go in there and educate them. But most salespeople have selling backwards in totally. the definition, totally. which is why you have a lot of people when you do a program and you were talking, you're in a room and you say, how many of you are in sales? Most people don't even want to raise their hand or they'll yeah. say, oh, well, yeah, but I don't really sell. I just help people, which means the premise is selling doesn't help people. Yeah, like right? you're abusing someone. In the right. Product. So most people think of sales as trying to talk someone into buying something they don't want or need. Mm -hmm. Actually, selling is just the opposite. It's helping, it's finding out what people want or need and helping them to get it. Some people think sales is about taking advantage of others. It's not. It's about giving people more advantage through your terrific product, services, or value you provide. Uh, but probably the biggest upside-down misconception about sales is that, at its essence, it's about taking. It's yeah. not. It's just the opposite. Sales is all about giving. And I mean that literally. You might say, well, wait a second, you don't mean that literally, you mean that figuratively. No, I mean it literally. Because the old English root of the word sale was, or sell, was sellan, which meant to give. So when you sell, when you're selling, you're giving. Now, someone might say, but isn't that just semantics? I don't think so. Because think about it, what are you giving when you're selling? When you're in the selling process, you're giving time, attention, counsel, education, empathy, and most of all, you're giving value. So if you're in sales, you should be proud of what you're selling, uh, proud of what you're doing, because what you're selling, by the very nature, has got to be providing value to that other person. Right. I, I, first off, I love that. And as an example, like in an industry like financial services. They are passing laws in certain countries that literally they're, they're, a salesperson selling, say, financial services products cannot be incentivized by what it is they're selling. And they actually, and in some cases, maybe the intention is good because you don't want people selling things that are just going to benefit the seller for commissions, even if it's, if it's a bad investment product, as an example. What 
the, the challenge, though, with not incentivizing or creating a culture where people can actually get paid for, for the attention, the creation, is where a vast majority of education comes from uh, in the world is from the salespeople. How do people actually learn about investments? Most people don't read books on investing. They actually learn from someone who's incentivized as a salesperson to actually educate them about life insurance or to educate them about certain sorts of investments. So, you know, the biggest teachers in the world, in my opinion, are the people that are out there selling because they're the ones that are talking to people about it. Sure. And, you know, it goes back to... Uh, first of all, behaviors that get rewarded get repeated. So mm -hmm. if you're if if salespeople are rewarded for providing value, they're going to keep producing. Uh, if you're punishing them for producing, they're going to stop producing. That's just the very nature of humanity. You may agree with it, may disagree with it. It's just the very nature of the thing. That's why when people are allowed to create in a free society, great things happen. More jobs are created. And by the way, you know, whenever I hear a, a, a person running for office talking about creating jobs. I, I go a little bit ballistic yeah. because government does not create jobs, or at least they don't create net jobs because anything they're cr creating, if you will, they have to first take away from the private sector. <laughs> yeah. okay? Plus, it yeah. costs them much more money than what they pay to create the job. Mm -hmm. Jobs are created by entrepreneurs. I love it. Jobs are created by entrepreneurs, people willing to take a risk, willing and who add value to people. And when they add value to people, people exchange their money. Remember, an, old, uh, an economic principle that is immutable, it is unchangeable, and that is people will exchange their money for that which they feel is of equal or greater value than the money they're exchanging it for. Yeah. So just like Adam Smith and the, you know, the baker and the brewer, they, they provide you the best they can at the best price, not because they love you, although that's great too because we you know we can talk about the, the the passion we have for our work and that's a fine thing but they know it's in their own best interest to provide a great product at the great at best price and provide superb customer service and do all those things because they're going to be rewarded for it right, right. and then when they are they can then expand and they they create jobs entrepreneurs create jobs not government and again we, you know we could go back to, to everything that being the basic principle of everything so let's go to sales and say who makes the best salespeople? What, what's the differentiation? What's the differentiator between the good salesperson or the adequate salesperson and the, the super mega successful producer? And people might think, well, it's, it's belief in what they do. And belief is certainly important. Mm -hmm. uh, and great salespeople, great producers totally believe in what they do. But so do a lot of average producers. So that's important, but not the the main thing. Right. Well, what about product knowledge? Don't the superb salespeople, don't they just, boy, do they uh, have great product. They inside, outside, backwards, sideways, diet. they know their product. Yes, they do. And so do many average salespeople. Mm -hmm. uh, so what about sales skills? Sales methodology. Isn't it important? Absolutely it is. Well, don't the top producers, don't they just really know everything about the sales process and about the, they sure do. And you know what, Joe? So do many average producers. Yeah. So while all those are important, um, uh, belief and product knowledge and sales skills, that's just baseline. That's what it takes to get into the game. That's the baseball player who can hit and run and throw. And, you know, that gets you into the game. But that, that's it. The, the top salespeople, the big difference between them and everyone else is their focus. They've shifted the focus. They know that in selling it isn't about you, it isn't about your product or service, it's about the other person and how you can serve their needs through the value you bring. So if, if, if this is great because what I, what I really would love is that everyone listening, for one, if they have any sort of bad association with selling, that it's obliterated after listening to you, oh, and, read, you. you know, and, and really read Bob's books. It'll give you a whole new paradigm if you have any of the misconceptions that exist about selling, and there's countless. Um, with people that are thinking, well, you know, I've got to pay my bills. I'm struggling. You know, I mean, it's. It, I understand. You know, the concept of maybe it's about the other person, but really, I'm kind of fixated on myself. I, I'd love to have you kind of explain how to really the approach uh, that you actually teach people not only will fully benefit you, but will create tremendous value for other people. So, how 
It's a good question because people say, well, okay, I understand. It's really nice, and they're going, we'll talk about the five laws and how they really apply. But at the outset, it seems, okay, that's great, the giving the other person, I need to make money right now. I'm in a one-on-one -on -one situation. I'm doing a sales presentation. So I would ask the person, what is going to elicit a prospect to do business with you right now? Right. Is it going to be because they can tell you're focused on making a buck? Or is it going to be because they know you're focused on providing value to them? Joe, money is an echo of value. It's the thunder to value's lightning. It means that if you're focused on providing value to that other person, they're going to feel good about you. They're going to know you, like you, trust you. They're going to trust your knowledge. And if your product answers their challenge or fulfills their desire, what have you, you're the one they're going to do business with right there. If they sense for a second that your focus is on yourself and that you see them as a paycheck or a commission check, that's where they're going to shut down. So which is going to happen faster if you're focused on them or focused on yourself? Right, totally. So how would you define value? Value is the relative worth or desirability of a thing to the end user. In fact, the, the big thing is understanding the difference between price and value. Yeah, well, explain that. Explain sure, that. because when we talk about the first law, the law of value says your, your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. But this can sound kind of counterintuitive. Give more in value than you take in payment, isn't that sort of just sounds, you know, nicey-nice, but <laughs> in the real world, right? Yeah. So let's understand the difference between price and value. Again, it comes back to premises and definitions. Um, price is a dollar amount. Price is a dollar figure. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing to the end user. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, this service, this concept, this idea that brings with it so much value that a person will not only exchange their money for it, but they'll be ecstatic that they did while you still make a, a very nice profit. Let me give you an example just to kind of put this in perspective. You hire somebody to do your tax returns. And uh, this accountant charges you, and we're going to just name a round figure that's very easy for us all to work with, charges you $2,000. That's the price. That's their fee. That's their price. Mm -hmm. But they save you $5,000 in taxes. They save you 25 hours of having to do it yourself. And they provide you with the security and peace of mind of knowing it was done correctly. So while they charged you $2,000, What's the value they provided? Well, $5,000 in savings, that's very concrete. That's concrete value. It's measurable. Totally. The 25 hours, well, we could say that's a little more conceptual, though we can also put our time to money. And you, but the peace of mind, that's like the old Visa commercial, right? Priceless. Right. So, so what they did is they gave you much more in value than they took in payment. They took in payment uh, $2,000. They gave you well over $5,000 in value and they still made a significant profit. Yeah. And that's the relationship, excuse me, that we want to have with everyone with whom we do business. Well, see what I love about that example is that's a perfect, uh, that, that's a perfect analogy of giving instead of selling. Because what, what did that accountant actually give someone? I mean, they gave them tremendous. Tremendous, they tremendous. Got, they got value. paid. And I, and, I, and I love that too. And I, I, even if it's to the point of redundancy, I, I, I'd like you to, you know, reiterate the importance that selling really is giving coming from sure. that context. Now, we talked earlier before we, we sat down and started uh, recording about, um, you know, selling can, I may made the analogy that, you know, marketing is an example, uh, can be used like, like a gun. You can use it to rob people or you can use it for self-defense. And selling is a concept. It is sure. a, well, I mean, what, what really is... It's a principle. Yeah, it's a, it, what, what, what really is the the good ways to, to utilize selling in the bad ways because, you know, I mean, many people just hear the term sell or they hear, they hear the term selling and they immediately conjure up bad sure. thoughts and, and a lot of people really need, that. that's why I think it's critical that if you uh, have any negative connotation towards selling or going out there and make, you know, solving problems for a profit, which is what I really think great entrepreneurs do, mm -hmm. that, exactly. absolutely why this topic matter, why your books are so so important is because is I think it's, it's, it's critical to redefine selling for people. But, uh, you know, if, if anyone, the but that I say is there's still going to be people that hear this and they're like, yeah, well, you know, I've had it beaten into my head that selling is technique, it's manipulation, it's talking people into it, and I really want 
our, our viewers and our listeners to walk away with one of the greatest skills and contributions you can make to yourself, to your family, and to mankind is to be effective at selling, which, me, sure. which, which you would say is effective at giving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, because remember, the entire thing is all about providing value to others. And again, it comes right back to that focus. And if the focus is on the other person, it's actually going to help you again, as we talked about earlier, both short term and long term. But let's take something, let's take a, a term that we talk about in Go Givers Sell More called a MacGuffin. Now, a MacGuffin uh, sounds like a, a breakfast you'd get at a fast food restaurant, but it's actually not. It's a, a MacGuffin is a movie term coined by uh, the late British film director Alfred Hitchcock. And a MacGuffin can be defined as the object around which the story revolves. Uh, a few quick examples. Uh, in the movie classic, The Wizard of Oz, the MacGuffin was Dorothy's quest to get back home to Kansas. In the movie Rocky, the MacGuffin was the eventual 15-round heavyweight championship fight with Apollo Creed. In the movie Titanic, the MacGuffin was the big, uh, unsinkable ship. Okay, those, those were the MacGuffins. But here's the funny thing. When you get to the end of the story, you come to realize that that thing the story was about really wasn't what the story was about. Uh, in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy always had the power to get back home to Kansas. What the story was about was four friends coming to realize that the very character trait they thought they most lacked, they actually had the entire time. They just needed to step into it and embrace it. In the movie Rocky, the battle was an internal struggle. It was one man beginning by feeling like a loser who by the end of the story he knew he had a lot of value to offer the world, especially those he loved and who loved him. Yeah. And uh, Titanic was not about a big boat. That was the MacGuffin, but that's not what it was about. It was a love story between two kids from totally opposite sides of the socioeconomic spectrum and how it would work out for them. Not too well for Jack, actually, I guess, if you, but that's another thing. But, but here's the thing. The, the MacGuffin, then, is not what the story's about. What it's about is, what the story's about, it's what's going to result in a happy ending for the prospect or customer. Uh, if you're in insurance, you're not really in insurance. The policies are simply your MacGuffins. You're in the business of providing peace of mind and security. If you're in real estate, uh, you might think you're in the, the business of selling homes. No, those homes are the MacGuffins. You're in the business of creating future memories. Uh, every year, Joe, um, millions and millions of people buy quarter-inch drill bits. Mm -hmm. And yet not one person buying one of those millions and millions of quarter-inch drill bits wants a quarter-inch drill bit. What they want is a quarter-inch hole. Yeah. The drill bit is simply the MacGuffin, the medium to get them what they really want, the quarter inch hole. And that's why we say, and this is, you know, again, one of those, those statements, we say you cannot make a sale. You say, what do you mean you can't make a sale? You have to make sales every day to survive. No, you can't make a sale because in a free enterprise based economy, you can't make anyone do anything. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can create the environment where a person knows you, likes you, trusts you, respects you, feels that your MacGuffin is the answer to their needs, wants, or desires, solves the problem, as you were talking about earlier, and they decide to buy. So while you can't make a sale, you can create the environment where someone, based on their own rational self-interest, chooses to buy, and you are there to receive the sale. Now, someone might say, well, wait a second, again, Berg, that's, isn't that just semantics? And my answer, Joe, is yes. It is semantics, but sometimes semantics are important. Not only in what you tell others about what you do, but in what you tell yourself about what you do. Because if you feel you're out there to make the sale, then it's about you and your MacGuffin, your product or service. If you feel you're out there to create the environment for the other person to do what's best for them, and you're just there to help them, then your focus is on the other person. It's on them, and that's exactly where it should be. That's fantastic. Now, uh, let's take it out of, uh, of selling out of the context of, of, of money. Uh, where, what are the applications uh, in life uh, is, is, are the principles and the laws that you actually describe in the go-giver applicable? 
You know, I think success in all its different forms, however one defines success, uh, and success can be defined many different ways depending upon the context. Uh, there can be financial success, but there are, can also be physical success, you know, financial, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, social, probably a lot of other ways. And it's still giving first to the process. It's adding value to the process first. It's having that as a focus, and I think that's the key. Yeah, what, what are some examples of people that have actually adopted uh, the mindset of the go-giver and how it's uh, how it shifted their, their lives from their income to just, with I mean, could you give some examples oh, well, of real they, people? They abound. And I mean, in, in go Giver Sell More, what we did is we took people who um, who submitted their stories to us, who actually told us uh -huh. how the go-giver changed the way they were doing business. It's not that they didn't know how to do business, and it's not that they, they didn't have what it took from the, from the get-go or from the give-go, but what it was, was it was simply the shift in focus. It's the person in, in Pittsburgh who wrote that he was having kind of a tough time really making ends meet, really making sales, until he read the first book, and all of a sudden his, his focus shifted from himself to, to the customer. And all of a sudden, boom, his income took off, his referrals took off. You know, it's the writer, the person who wanted to be a writer, who said, okay, how do I do this? How do I make this shift? And all of a sudden he said, well, instead of focusing on what I can get from placing my articles, what value can I give the blog host who might want to, you know, print my articles? Mm -hmm. It's the person who, the um, consultant who uh, did a presentation, he was asked to take on a certain job, which he knew he wasn't qualified to do. So what he did is he referred someone else. Okay, yeah. Yeah. but that person was so grateful, and what it did is said, "Wow, if he's willing to do this because he doesn't think he's the right person, he must be great at what he's at, what, at his core competency." Yeah. And he's done a ton of business with that person. Joe, we hear these all the time, yeah. and what we also find is that the people who have really adopted this book and shared it with others, because we've had companies, we've had groups who bought thousands of these. The biggest one, I think, bought fifteen thousand of these to, to spread throughout their company. They were already doing this. You know, I'm often asked in interviews in, in, with traditional media, and they kind of look at you sort of like they want to find the weak link. They want to find where you... And say, well, what have you and John David Mann created here that's written about that's anything new? And my answer is always, nothing. <laughs> this is nothing that the top producers, the top leaders haven't been doing for years. Right. It's just that now, maybe because of John David Mann's brilliant writing, they... It was in a story that they could then take the principles and maybe adapt them as they taught them. Right. But they're the ones who, who, who adopted this first. Yeah. You know, not the people who necessarily needed it. Fortunately, there's been enough great people, people like yourself and other leaders and people who've gotten behind the book and, and you know, shared the thoughts with it that it's really kind of taken off and, and that's very gratifying. Yeah. Well, no, and you know, look, if, if, if there's anything that I think is most useful for people to spend their time developing skills and capabilities on, it's those areas where it's going to obviously make them more money, help create more value in the world. I mean, there's a lot of things that people can spend their, their time reading. This, you know, from my perspective, the, the and you even mentioned this in, in, in the books, is it's, it's not about just selling. This, this is about human behavior. Mm -hmm. This is about understanding yeah, absolutely. what were the motivations behind human beings. And it simply allows you to become more effective at communicating and helping other, you know, getting what you want is a function of helping other people get what they want. Well, the, the term go-getter, uh, what's the difference between a go-getter, because we're taught to be go-getters, <laughs> right. be motivated, you know, go <laughs> and look for what it is you want. I mean, what, 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 what's the difference between a go-getter and a go-giver? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and it's a natural question. Well, you know, Bob, you and John are saying go-giver. Are, are, are the two of you saying that being a go-getter isn't a good thing? Absolutely not, of course. Being a go-getter is a great thing. Uh, we, we love go-getters because go-getters take action. And you know, Joe, uh, you've been teaching and, and doing for so long. You know that all the great thoughts in the world, all the great intent, if action isn't put with it, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the thing is, there is no... There is no natural division between a go-getter and a go-giver. Many go-getters are also go-givers, and every go-giver is also a go-getter. The opposite of a go-giver is not a go-getter. The opposite of a go-giver is a go-taker. Gotcha. That's the person who feels almost entitled, if you will, mm -hmm. to take, 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 without having added value to the process, to the person, to the situation. And they're often frustrated by the fact that even though they might work hard and even though they might, they never seem to obtain the kind of real 
success they feel they deserve. And even in those rare times they do, it's typically pretty short-lived, and yet they think everybody else is naive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the beginning of the story, Joe was described as a frustrated go-getter, and he was, but not because he was a go-getter. It was because he was a go-getter, but he was also a go-taker. It was pretty much all about Joe. Now, as he learned the five different, laws... Different Joe. A different yeah. Joe, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and as he learned the five laws, and as he applied them, because, you know, the, the one um, element... Uh, that he had to do in order to be mentored was that he had to apply those laws that very night. And we have a lot of people who write in to say they do that, just yeah. like in the, in the story. So when we, and as he did this, he shifted beautifully from a guy who was a, a go-getter with a go-taker's heart to a go-getter with a go-giver's heart. So when we talk about being a go-giver, or again, simply talking about that man or woman who has learned, or perhaps intuitively knew, that it's that person who can shift their focus from being I-focused or I-oriented to being other-focused or you-focused, mm -hmm. who accomplishes the most? The one that is focused on the other person. Absolutely, and it's not, and, and you know, we say this because, and, and I think it's important that uh, when we talk about this, when we say focus on the other person, there's nothing martyrish about this, yeah. you know, there's nothing self-sacrificial, uh, nothing about being a doormat, no, this is simply, it's a, it's a way in which we align our principles and values, uh, understanding that that person who is focused on providing value to others that's the person who's going to succeed. It, again, it's a great way to live life, and it's very profitable. Yeah, no, totally. And I mean, I even, uh, with public speaking, when I first um, had to do my first presentation, I was, I actually wrote a sales letter, and I, um, uh, which is funny, you take the term sales letter, you know, uh, where, where I, I wrote a sales letter, and I filled up a, you know, a small room. There was maybe like 50 or 60 people at the first event. I charged $97 for this. Which was like 58 more people than at my first event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, it was, and I never publicly, really publicly spoken before, and I sold an eight-hour, full-day seminar with just me, no other speakers. <laughs> and people are like, oh, after a few minutes, you kind of get over it. I mean, I was sweating bullets the entire day. I was a nervous wreck. But at the end of the event, people invested $12,000 in the stuff that I was offering, that I was selling. And uh, so I, I quickly decided this is probably a good idea to just get out and talk to people and, and uh, you know, offer what it is, it is I got to offer. And what really helped me is someone told me if you ever feeling extremely nervous uh, in, in, in a selling situation, not that this is going to cure everything, but it's just focus on the other people, focus on the audience, you know. And so if you're ever in a situation where you're just, you know, I mean, if you really think about how can I create value for the other person, it truly makes all the difference in the world. Sure. If you're ever feeling, you know, intimidated or a little confused, there's a real good solution. Uh, flip it to the go. Exactly. Give her sort right. of state of mind, and that solves a lot mm -hmm. of tremendous problems. Well, let's talk about the, the five laws. Law number one is the law of value. Law number two is the law of compensation. Law number three is the law of influence. Law number four is the law of authenticity. And law number five is the law of receptivity. Okay? Now, while we talk about the first law, which is value, and that's, that's the foundational principle, the second law is a follow-up to that, and that's the law of compensation. And this says your income is determined by uh, how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to provide more in value than you take in payment while still making a profit, of course, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives we add that exceptional value to, the more money with which we'll be rewarded. We go back to that account in the first example. He did a great job of providing more in value than he took in payment. If you're his client, you probably feel great about him. You do business with him again, and you probably refer him to others. Well, most likely, his other clients feel the same way. So our accountant is very quickly amassing what we call an army of personal walking ambassadors. And as he continues to add that kind of exceptional value to the lives of more and more people, his income will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And it's the same for all of us in all situations and all professions. Now, adding value, providing value is great, but that, as Nicole Martin says in the story, that only represents your potential income. If you have only one client that you're adding that great value to, it's probably not going to make you a lot of money. So somebody says, well, wait a second, I only have one client, but this person, I make a huge a fortune from providing value to him. Sure, but there's two things about that. One is this one client probably themselves, they serve so many people that indirectly you're providing value to a lot of people. Right. But secondly, if you've only got one client, you're probably living in fear every day of losing that one client. So probably not a good idea. Um, 
So, so it's not enough to just provide great value to one person. It's also a matter of impact. It's a matter of reach. So we can kind of sum up the first two laws, Joe, by saying exceptional value plus significant reach equals very high compensation. Gotcha, gotcha. Love it, love it. Thank you. Well, okay, so one thing I want to, you, you write in the book that uh, this term actions often precede feelings. I wanted you to talk about that because it's, it's, uh, it's, if you act in a certain way, it's going to produce certain sorts of, and, and when you're in, in a selling situation, which I personally believe everything in life is Absolutely. a selling situation. You know, you know what, what do you actually mean by that? Because I think one of, the, uh, uh, one of the things that I see a lot of people do is they read lots of books and, and they may be you know, doing affirmations and they want confidence and they want to sit mm -hmm. and think and dream and hope that the law of attraction brings them confidence or, uh, or a feeling of uh, whatever they're pursuing. But you, know, you basically know and understand that if you act a certain way, it's going to produce certain results. So what do you mean by that? Well, then we'll come back to the, uh, yeah, to the laws. I, I think what happens is we've been taught that to be genuine, to be authentic, if you will, you have to feel a certain way before you act that way. Uh, and it's, that's totally backwards. Uh, we act our way into feeling. Now, Dr. David Schwartz, in his great book, The Magic of Thinking Big, was the first person I learned this, this from. And it's so true. I mean, if you, if you feel lazy and lethargic and you're going to wait until all of a sudden you feel good and feel ready before you start doing anything, the chances are you'll never do anything, at least right. not for a long time. Right. But what if you straighten up and walk tall and what if you walk with energy as though you have something going on, as though you're already excited and ready to get started and you start acting it, all of a sudden you, those feelings are going to follow. The feelings follow the physiology, basically. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's nothing new. It's nothing, oh, like everything else, it's nothing I made up. It's been around for a long time. It's the same thing. Just, you know, if you don't feel very happy, now I'm not talking about a, a, a chemical imbalance, but I'm talking about if you're just in a lot, kind of a lousy down mood, okay? Are you going to wait until you feel good before you smile? No. Create the good feeling by smiling. Mm -hmm. In fact, you cannot, we know the mind can't uh, hold two opposing thoughts simultaneously. Right. So just put a big inside out smile on your face and just try to feel sad. You can't. You can't do it. So you're going to act your way into feeling. Now, does this mean you're inauthentic? Absolutely not. It means you understand that you want to be, you want to be and you want to act as your best authentic self. And as human beings, we can actually act ourselves into feeling a certain way. Yeah, totally, totally. What if you want to use this in really scummy ways? Let's talk about that. Let's like, I'm totally kidding. I, well, I have a saying. I have a saying. There is nothing worse or there's nothing more dangerous than a bad person with good people skills. You're, you're right. You because people, it's a people principle. That, people that can fake sincerity or, yeah. Right, it's right. like gravity. You know, we were talking earlier, it's about, about principles. It, right. It's like marketing principle. Marketing is very righteous, but if you use it in a, in a wrong way, uh -huh. uh, sales the same way, anything the same way. Uh, it's, it's like gravity. Gravity is a principle. It works whether you want to believe it does or not. Right. Gravity is very positive if it keeps us from floating up aimlessly into space. <laughs> gravity has a very negative effect if we walk off a seven-story building. Ex yeah. So, and that's why the person who utilizes uh, these principles, these skills, these, hopefully they're a good person. Here's the good news though, that it's, it's hard to really be a creep and be successful for too long. Especially nowadays, even more so. You are so exposed nowadays. You know, back in the days when there were no reviews about Amazon or on eBay or, you know, I mean, Yelps and all of the other mm -hmm. ways that people can find out. Yeah, I mean, it. it's always, you know, I learned early on in my career uh, this this great term I heard: uh, "Be nice to the people you meet on the way up, mm -hmm. and the same people you meet on the way down." Mm -hmm. And I've always, tr I mean, you know, I even tell people all the time, you know, it, 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 obviously next month may, might be different, but you know, try to find dirt on me on the internet. I mean, we we take care of our clients. <laughs> we, it, and you know, it, it's just even if you're <laughs> even if you don't consider yourself a really nice human being, it's just good business to go out it and create value for other people. It is good. And Ben Franklin talked about that in his in in one of his. Well, I'm a big big Frank uh, uh -huh. Ben Franklin buff. So, uh, and he talked about that. He talked about if he's, it was. And I'm paraphrasing here, so please pardon me. But if if, if rascals understood how profitable it was to act righteous, then all at rascals would act righteous just out of pure rascality. <laughs> You know, in other words, that is know, fantastic. I love that. And that's why 
if government would stay out of the marketplace, other than protecting from force or fraud, yeah. if they would stay out of the marketplace, the market will. The market is the best regulator. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's do it. Let, let's cover the other uh, the other laws, and then I'm going to come back and ask you some questions related to a couple things you just said, which I okay. Uh, the law of influence is law number three, okay. and the law of influence says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, again, this to me sounds like the most counterintuitive, even counterproductive, maybe Pollyanna-ish law, right? right? What do you mean your input, how abundantly? And it makes perfect sense. Um, you know, in, in my book, Endless Referrals, which was written a long time ago, there was a basic premise to this book. And this... <laughs> go, go to... Go online and buy this book right now. Berg.com. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. B-U-R-G.com. Yeah. And... <laughs> The, the premise of this book, the underlying premise, was something we, we alluded to earlier. All things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. And it's, the, it's what Sam tells, tells Joe, our Joe in the story, uh, about the golden rule of sales, of business, of network, and what, what have you. There, Joe, there is no more efficient, effective, quicker, more powerful way to elicit the no like, and trust feelings toward you from other people than to constantly shift that focus and put their interest first. Mm -hmm. And again, every great salespeople knows this. Every leader, every leader knows this principle, and they live their lives through this principle. These are the level five leaders in Jim Collins' Good to Great, or Oren Woodward and Chris Brady's Launching a Leadership Revolution. This is what John Maxwell talks about in his books of leadership. This is what Lee Heron talked about in his book, Making Your Company Human. Most people don't know about Lee Heron. Lee Heron was a guy who in the early, in mid-60s, he took over as CEO of O.C. Scott uh, Company, the lawn and garden people. He, he was CEO until the early 80s. Uh, he wrote a book called Making Your Company Human because he feels a lot of the leaders today have it backwards. They're more interested in themselves than about their team. Right. And what he did is he put his, his customers first, he put his team first, and the company was already successful when he took over. By the time he was through with it 18 years later, they were mega. They were hugely successful. I blogged about him on the Berg.com blog. I did a series on him because nobody, the mainstream does not buy into his book, does not accept his book. It's a beautiful book. And I, I talked to him on the phone after, what a, a nice, humble man. But I got emails from people who worked there and said everything about him in the book is exactly how he ran his company. And people considered those, those days the best days of their lives, working for O.C. Scott. And again, it was hugely profitable. He took the company from here to here, mm -hmm. putting other people's interests first. Again, there's nothing uh, doormatish about this. There's nothing self-sacrificial. This is good business. And it's a good way to live life. Well, what about people that may be watching that believe, you know, I really do put people's needs first. I really do care about other people. And I'm broke. My business isn't working. I mean, because um, you talked about, you know, that there are different levels of, of results. Uh, what, what do you, how do you help someone like that, that re really thinks that they operate mm -hmm. and live this way and they're not producing results. Yeah, that's a great question. The chances are, Joe, that they are not they are not following the fifth law, which is the law of receptivity. Okay? Uh, because it's all of it. You know, it's not just giving. See, all the giving in the world is is for nothing if you don't make yourself willing to receive. Mm. So when someone says, Well gosh, I give and I give there's different types of giving too. There's a type of giving that's a martyr's giving. You know, you yes. give but you don't want any, and you, in fact, you refuse to receive, right? right, right because right. because there's also a payoff there. It keeps you as the victim. Totally. Yeah. And that is mostly unconscious. There's a great book, and I know you you have read this book, and our great friend Dan Kennedy used to always talk about this, uh, Psycho-Cybernetics oh, yeah. by Dr. Maltz. Maxwell Maltz. Yeah. This is a book, what a perfect way. It really shows you how the mind, when it's programmed correctly, is going to take you to victory. But when garbage gets in there, and usually without our knowing it, right, it can it can mess us up so that even though on a conscious level we say, oh, yeah, I mean, I want to add value and I want to make a lot of money and I want to live a... If the unconscious is saying, uh-uh, that's not really what you believe, you believe rich people are evil, right. then what's going to happen? You're going to sabotage us. So I would say everybody can get that book, yeah, uh, Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz, and he's going to explain in real layperson's terms. I just did a restudy of that book, and oh, man, it's so... It is it, fascinating. It, 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 it really is. Great. 
But and so, but if they're not receiving, see if in in the story, uh, Pindar says to Joe, he, he asks Joe to breathe out for thirty seconds and try to hold that breath. Well, Joe can't do it. And Pindar says, "What's the matter, Joe?" And, you know, he's gasping for you. What's the matter, Joe? Can't can't do it. Can't hold the the count till third. Joe says, "No, I, I I can't just breathe out. I've got to breathe in as well." And Pindar says, "Well, Joe, what if I was to tell you it's been medically proven that it's actually healthier to breathe out than it is to breathe in?" Joe says, "That's silly." Hey, you got to do both. You, know, you breathe, of course, you breathe out carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out which is giving, you breathe in which is receiving. Giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work in tandem. Neither are more, neither is or are more righteous than the other. Mm -hmm. It's both. Yeah. And, and, you, and here's the thing. That, that's, that's one of the best explanations that I, uh, that's, that's, that's great. Um, well, that's a John Manism, i got to tell you. They, he's, that's one of those things he came up with. If, if that, you were to get in a that, physical uh, fight with John, do you think you could take him? Uh, who, John David Mann? Yeah. Uh, I guess it was depends on who, who has more of a reason. <laughs> I don't know. Why do you, why do you ask? No, I'm d d just totally messing around. <laughs> okay. I want, you know, hopefully, if John watches this, I'm creating some sort of animosity between two guys that are really trying to be nice to each other all the time. No, you easy. obviously admire each other. Uh, yeah, well, and I would love to see like a celebrity. I admire event. John. I don't know. I'm not saying, he, you know, I'm not assuming anything. <laughs> yeah, he, was a, he was a great guy to work with. It was really, it's really a, a terrific experience to write with someone who really, boy, just adds so much. You know, you know let me ask you about that because um, how do you guys maintain such a great collaboration? Because a lot of people in partnerships that you know they, they, they end up really not not working out. I mean, what what's your and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that you have become a student of your own game. I mean, you you, uh, you you basically were probably this way long before you ever wrote a book about it. I would I would imagine. I have been extremely blessed to have great parents, mm -hmm. really loving parents. And, you know, I live near them to this day. I get to see them every day, and I, I just I I'll just I thank God every day for them. That's I, fantastic. So growing up with that was. Uh, you know, which didn't mean like anybody else. I didn't have my problems, things I went through, but it's certainly great having a supportive, you know, uh, home team, as Zig Ziglar would say. Right. Um, and so I got to see an example of what being a go-giver is without having a name for it. Mm -hmm. when, I, uh, when I first put the story, wanted to put the story together, um, I uh, had mentioned to you that I, uh, because I wanted to take endless referrals and, and take the basic premise and make it into a parable, because I love reading parables. Mm -hmm. you know, as you can imagine, I'm a voracious reader. You know? right. And uh, But doing a, a, um, writing a, a, a how-to book uh, is actually pretty easy, share what you know. Right. Writing a fictional story is, is different, that's yeah. a special talent. Yeah. When I called John uh, and, and asked him to, because John used to be my, uh, he was the editor-in-chief of a magazine I used to write for. And so when I'd send my articles, John would, would edit them. And there's a little bit of a defensiveness, I think, when you send articles in. Because it's not that you think they're not a good writer, because I, I didn't know John at the time, but you're worried they're going to take the stuff that you really need to have in there and leave it on the cutting room floor and, and shorten something for the sake of brevity when it's really... Well, John was so good at what he did, he would send back the, the, uh, the articles to me, correct, and he'd say, he's a very humble guy, so he'd say, well, I made a correction here, I added this here, is this okay? And the running joke became, I'd send a, an email back saying, John, you know, not only is it, is it great, it, uh, you write my stuff better than I write my stuff. Yeah. Okay? So I knew <laughs> when I was going to put together, I wanted him as the key writer. And he told me, because he, he, had, he had spoken with this about with his fiance at the time, Anna, now his wife, he said, you know, I don't have time to do this. Because John's very sought out. He's the ghostwriter behind a lot of books you've heard of. And uh -huh. he can't even say, you know, who. Yeah. And he said, but how can I say no to at least talking with him about it? It's Bob. Again, the no, like, and trust was there. The relationship had been developed. Yeah. And so then eventually he and Anna came down. They were visiting her mom in Tampa. They came across state to visit me. I showed him the very basic sketchy treatment. He said, well, let me take it back and look at it because I really don't have the time to. And then three weeks later he called back. He said, I think we've got something here. Huh. And so, but awesome. you know, awesome. and so it's very easy to collaborate with him because, first of all, because I know he's such a superior writer, I'd be, I'd be crazy to let my ego stand in the way of, you know, what's great writing. But he just happens to be a real nice guy. That's so, <laughs> well, you know, no, what's cool about that is, is like, I th there's a thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately in, in my life and the way that I look at my business, and and the term came through a discussion that I was having at, at my Genius Mastermind uh, group with uh, Dan Sullivan. Uh, and, and the term was multiplication by subtraction, how to actually multiply your success, your growth, your income by taking out the things that are unnecessary and don't really, and, and I've started to think of interactions, relationships, project, people as 
multipliers or subtractors, you know, and subtractors would be the takers, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the multipliers are the givers. And the collaborations between, when you take a multiplier and you put them with another multiplier and you're aligned, um, magic happens. Oh, it's exponential. I, it's, it's, yeah. And, and, and I think it's so great. And so that's why I really love uh, your message and, and, and resonate with it because, you know, frankly, why is anyone watching this? You know, why does anyone watch any of my Genius Network interviews or, or any of the stuff that I do? I mean, on, on some level, they want results. And in sure. order to get results, they, they need capabilities. And one of the, the interesting, and, and, it, and it does, and you say this a lot, it, it, a lot of it may sound counterintuitive, that in order to have life give you what you want, you need to go out and, and give more. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely, you know, life gives uh, to the giver and takes from the taker. And isn't that true? And, and, and if you can look at you, you, the parts of, uh, of you or other people where they're takers or they're self-centered or they're not really creating value and subtract those parts and just leave, you know, that's how you multiply yourself. And, uh, you know, the, the impact that this can have, uh, not only to an individual that might be watching this and is in a sales position or happens to own a business is one thing, but to adopt this sort of philosophy in schools and communities and cultures and government would, would, would be by gigantic. I mean, what would, uh, what would be your ideal hope for, uh, like, what, what, what would you love to see as the ultimate result for individuals and people that actually read your book, go through your, your process? Yeah, and by the way, when you mentioned schools, there have been schools that have, have bought the book. We have one at, uh, at uh, Wheeler High School in Valparaiso, Indiana, who actually does a curriculum with this. They buy this for the seniors. Oh, really? And they actually, right, because they want these principles to be applied, you know, by these, these people. And that's why I love the idea. When, when people tell me that they read this as a story time to their young kid. Oh, Yeah, man, there's I, even a story I, in the beginning where the guy gives right, yeah. it to his child. Mm -hmm. his yeah, yeah, he says, he, he, yeah, he said... Uh, that if my, if my kid never even gets in, because this person's a professional salesperson, he's very proud of what he does, he says, even if my kid never gets into sales, I would want him to read this book, Go Give Her right. Sell More, because of the principles involved. And, and that's really, and I think you hit it on the head, that's what I want to have happen with this book. I want this book to touch people's lives in a way so that they see that by using these principles, not only are they going to touch the world in a very beneficial way, uh, they're going to really help themselves while they're at it. And it's that... You know, uh, again, we, we've been taught that lack mentality from um, almost from the time we're born. You know, and whether it's a combination of, of, of upbringing, uh, environment, schools, the uh, uh, television news, uh, television shows... Uh, movies where there's so many messages of lack. I mean, uh, Randy Gage, I don't know if you know Randy, but he's a great guy and, and uh, a great entrepreneur. And he does the best vignette or riff I've ever seen about how every movie, every major movie, ma uh, major blockbuster movie pretty much has one, one uh, premise. And that is there are two types of people. There are the, the heroes, the good people, who are always poor, but they're happy. They're always poor and happy. But they're always stepped on, put down, pushed around, taken advantage of by who? The rich people who are mean and nasty and cowardly and you're right. And, yeah, yeah, and, and totally. they take it right. It, it just about, well, these are this is these are unconscious messages. Now there's no conspiratorial reason for it. No. It's just it sells. Yeah. And so uh, people grow up not even realizing these are the messages they're taking in. Taking in. Yeah. And Dr. Maltz talks about that in his book in a, in a certain way, that, that that's what we have to undo a lot of times. To, right. and, um, and so these messages of, of, of lack, the, these messages, of, it's what we call the treacherous dichotomy. The treacherous dichotomy, or, or what we could also call the false dilemma. And a false dilemma, Joe, is the unnecessary use of the word or. Do you want to be wealthy or happy? Right? It can yeah. only be one. Nonsense. It's both. Are you a giver or a receiver? Both. Are you a nice person or do you finish first? Both. Huh. And so that's what the me we want this message to be. It's, a, it's not an either or. It's an and. Gotcha. Love it. Love it. Well, let's talk about the law of uh, authenticity. Okay. Uh, the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. And this is an interesting one, and I'd like to, after you define it, I want to ask you... Uh, what I think uh, an interesting perspective that some people may have about uh, the whole term authenticity. Well, first sure. off, define it. Define authenticity. Yeah. Well, the law of authenticity simply says the greatest gift, the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. 
uh, Deborah in the story learn that all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills, as important as they are, and, and yes, they are very important, mm -hmm. they're all for naught if you don't come across from a true, authentic core. And just as importantly, if you can't communicate that authenticity. But when you show up day after day after day as the same person, people embrace that, they respect that, they're more liable to, to know, like, and trust you. Now, one of the messages, one of the messages is you are enough as you are. What we're saying is everybody has greatness within them. Everybody has intrinsic value and value they can offer others. Uh, people ask, well, how do I learn to become more authentic? And the good news is authenticity isn't something you need to, to learn. It's only something you need to embrace because at your core, you already are your true authentic self and you are good enough. But there's an asterisk there. When we say you are good enough, we don't mean you stop learning. We don't mean you stop becoming a better authentic self. That's why, you know, the person who says, well, I'm authentically angry and I yell at people and to be anything else would be inauthentic. Baloney. It simply means they authentically have an issue that they need to authentically work on and become a higher, more conscious, more effective, authentic self. It's also a matter of reading and listening and attending functions and programs like your great groups you put together. I mean, I just think of the wisdom involved. Now, here's the thing. You know, we can, the, the sages asked, who is a, a wise person? And the answer is one who learns from all others. Now, here's the thing, though. See, I can learn from studying Joe Polish. I can learn from studying Dan Kennedy and Ivan Meisner and Dondi Scumachi and, and so many others. Okay? But I can't be Joe Polish. I can't be Dan Kennedy. I can't be Ivan Meisner. I can't be Dondi Scumachi. So what we want to do is we adapt their wisdom, but we don't try to adopt their personalities. In other words, we adapt, we don't adopt. We learn from them, but we stay true to our authentic core. Well, yeah, see, because when someone tries to pretend they're someone that they're not, I mean, they in many cases they come across looking like total jackasses or you know completely sure. inauthentic. Well, um, and you address this and talk about this, and as you have just now uh, a little bit, and, and you go really deep with it in in, in the book. Um, if someone feels like well, I'm scared, I'm frightened, I don't have anything to give, I don't have anything, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but you don't really know me. I mean, I just, uh, you know, I don't have any confidence whatsoever, I'm introverted, I'm shy, uh, I can't sell, I can't do this. What? Explain that a little bit, because you, you know, th there are those mindsets that prevent people from going out and, and, and being effective. Sure, and I think one of the things they need to do, and, and by the way, Deborah had this same challenge in the book. She just did not see that she had anything of value. It was almost a mistake that she learned the kind of value she had to offer. And it's just understanding that we do. Intrinsically, we all have something that we're good at. And, you know, we always hear the thing, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, that, you know, take the combination of what you love to do, uh, just what brings you joy to do, and what you're good at, and, and often... We've been created, so those are pretty close, usually. Okay, now I would have loved to have been the third baseman for the Boston Red Sox, but I didn't have the talent to go along with it. But I sure could have gotten a job in sports marketing if I wanted. So in other words, there's always something we can do with our with what we love to do. Right. And so it's that, you know, find what you're what you're you're good at, what you love to do, what you're good at, and how can you make it marketable. Now to make it marketable, you have to find a way to provide value to others. But if someone just feels they, they just don't have anything, then first of all, I'm going to say, and I, and I don't mean this in a, um, uh, in a sarcastic way, I mean a real way, they need to, to get some help with that. They need oh. to see someone, whether it's a, a, you know, a, a professional counselor, or whether it's a, prof you know, a professional coach, which does the same thing. They need to talk with who can help walk them through that. Because right. often, you know, we're so blind to our own strengths, mm -hmm. as well as weaknesses sometimes, yeah. that we need that other person who's less passionate about the situation to help us find that. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. Well, and by the way, you can be sarcastic to any of my viewers. Because I had a feeling they're, that they're, was they're, the case. They're used to it with me. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so in the book, uh, you got the five laws of stratospheric success, um, which I like that word, by the way. Uh, so you, we've talked about the, the law of value, the law of compensation, the law of influence, the law of authenticity, and the law of receptivity. And um, 
when someone reads uh, The Go-Giver, when someone reads uh, Go-Giver Sell More, um, I mean, what will it actually do for their mindset? What will it do for their capabilities in terms to go out and, and interact with others uh, for profits and just simply for in life? I mean, what's, what's, what's the, uh, the, 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 true, the true takeaway and benefit that someone would get from, from your, your, your um, processes? Because sure. I, I don't look at this as just a book. I look at it as something much deeper beyond that. I mean, it's like a course in, in relating uh, oh, in a very you. positive way to people. And so it's... Uh, you know, the, the, this will actually define and show you how to play the game, but the the end result is what? For Well, thank you. I think really it's a matter of, of having confidence. Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of having confidence to know there's a that there's not only a methodology to something, there's not only systems. I mean, systems are very important. We, you know, we certainly, and I define a system as the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles, okay? It's studying, it's so much of what you teach and with that, you know, that I love and with Dan Kennedy and so many of the people, that, you know, and, and systems are great. And, and I think it's also a matter of, of, of having the confidence to know that the systems are there, but in the end, it's also a matter of understanding that you've got what it takes to apply them. Yeah. And I think this book, you know, I think the first one in story form gives more of a conceptual idea that, you know, yeah, okay, I can see where this would really work, and if I just shift that focus and I do that, it's a fun story to read, and you can go through it again and again and pick something up new every time. And then in Go Give or Sell More, we, we kind of try to take that and make a little more of a practical application to sales. One friend of mine said that even making calls on the phone, because she does a, a outward calling on the phone, and at one point, she started to feel a little bit like, wow, I don't want to make this next call. And then she looked at a part in the book where we said, you know, if you're really having trouble calling, it might be that you're focused on yourself. Instead, take the focus off yourself and put it on the other person. And she said, all of a sudden, boom, I, I understood what it was that was holding me back. I was focused on myself. Right. So it's that little bit of a shift in the confidence in being able to use that shift and, and, and take it. And I know that person too, and that she's pretty self-centered. So the fact that you—I'm totally kidding. No, that's that is great, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Well, um, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, and then I'm going to—I want to ask you a little bit about endless referrals. Um, you know, what is—is uh, is there what sort of skills does someone uh, need in order to, to to sell something? I mean, uh, someone that's watching this has not read the books. They they have a definition in their mind of what selling means and, and hopefully it's been you know very positively changed and affected by Thank by you. just hearing you know a little bit that we've talked about but what does someone really need in order to, 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 to sell something well I believe an understanding of sales concepts and methodology is very important mm -hmm. and some people uh, have have thought and again people uh, will always interpret something based on their paradigm based on how they see the world so when we talk about sometimes in the book that you know we love the whole the sales process, and of course I learned doing those. And, and, uh -huh. um, but just because we say that the focus is on the other person and that the, the sales process is only there to you know serve the process, not to overcome people. So you're saying that there's sales techniques or methodologies or processes are a bad thing? No, it's not an either or. It's an and. It's a both. And I believe people like Brian Tracy and Tom Hopkins and Zig Ziglar, some of the ones I first you know, learned from, yeah, and these yeah. people, what great value they provide. to Because remember, the sales process, Joe, is nothing more than, as you alluded to earlier, understanding the way the human mind works. Mm -hmm. And salespeople are needed. Things don't just sell themselves. And anything that's selling itself, it's already been sold. Exactly. And it's just the... It, you know, I so, love, I love, that's such a great distinction, yeah. Yeah, and so we need sales skills. We need to understand this. We need to know how to work with people in a way that we're best able to add value to their lives. And a lot of that is sales methodology. So I think anybody starting out in sales, and I often talk about right from, from in front of an audience, you know, go to Brian Tracy, Psychology of Selling. Go to, you know, so-and-so and, and Zig and Tom and I. Priceless information. Very valuable. So sure, learn that. But what we want to do is is we want to be the, and I was talking about when talking about a system, you want to be the master of the system. Mm -hmm. The system is supposed to be your servant, not your master. Don't get so caught up in it that you, you know, you make your life about it. Right. <laughs> right. Well, because that could get very scary when sure. people, their whole life is, yeah, they're, they're, all, you know, they're like robots. Um, 
Awesome. Well, first off, thank you for sharing all that because, uh, you know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people. A lot of times they will just kind of talk about sort of the surface level stuff just so people will go out and buy their book. And there's tremendous value that you've given here oh, talking about it. And I uh, see that you're a perfect example of being a go-giver because everything that you shared here is just really valuable content that wow, people in and, and, and more of a reason. So if you go out and buy his book, you know, why are you buying Bob's book? Because he just gave you a tremendous amount here. Uh, on this interview, that I mean, so you know, if you really want to know how to do what it is, he, I mean, you just observed it. I mean, you saw a perfect example of a person being a go-giver just by sitting down and having a, a, a conversation with a goofball like me. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, on my web, on my, on my podcast on iTunes, which is fortunately just people love it, and and we're doing, you know, we're we're being go-givers there. Me and Dean Jackson, we just uh, talk about awesome marketing, and we love marketing, and. Um, uh, you obviously love marketing also. You love selling. Uh, we, we both do. Um, I think uh, selling and marketing are the vehicles that bring all of the great value to the Absolutely. world. And you are a huge proponent uh, for salespeople uh, in, in, the, in the free market. And I'd love to get more of your philosophy. You, you touched on it you know, earlier about the marketplace uh, you know, m making determinations. Sure. Uh, I'd love to have just some of your philosophical thoughts about again, the role of government and the role of the entrepreneur, um, because I, th I think it's so important. And, and then I'm going to just suggest, if you like what you're about to hear Bob say, then go to his uh, blog at uh, Berg, B -U -R -G, mm -hmm. dot com and type in capitalism uh, versus socialism and, <laughs> and read the uh, article he's written and many of the things you've written about capitalism, because uh, you are a, uh, you're, you're a proponent for... Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, you... It, Anywhere where capitalism is a, and again, we're talking about true capitalism, and we always have to go back to redefining terms because it's really an educational process. Uh, capitalism has been so slandered and misdefined totally, yeah. that when people say capitalism, people have 10 different ideas of what capitalism is. And that's why when people say, oh, sure, capitalism, but what about when big business is buying favors from, well, again, that's not capitalism, that's corporatism, and there is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that when we, that first of all, we learn as much about capitalism, true capitalism, as we can. Now, in, in the blog series, I think there's about 17 different articles, and you can go through. But what also, go through not just the articles, if you choose to do that, but the responses from people. Because while there are people who agree with me, there's a lot of people who really took, you know, who, who again, they're looking at the world from a different point. And it's not that they're bad people. We typically want the same things. We want to live in a society where people are free to do as they please, so long as they don't infringe upon the rights of others to do the same. We want uh, we want the poor to be taken care of. We want people to have, you know to to be able to have access to good, affordable health care. The difference is we see capitalism, true capitalism, as the vehicle to doing that. Right. Someone else might see socialism as the vehicle to do that. So one of the most important things is to learn all you can about true capitalism. There are books out there that really um, define capitalism the correct way, and it allows you to teach others that same thing. You know, uh, a good friend of ours, Robert Ringer, who's one of the best writers on, on capitalism and free market economics, talks about that about 30% of the people out there really understand free market capitalism. About 30% of the people totally would like this country to be a, a socialistic utopia. And of course, those are two words that don't go together because socialism always uh, ends in starvation, it ends in deaths, it ends in, in communism. Then there's about 40% of the people who really don't know. Right. And we can educate them. Mm -hmm. okay? But you don't educate people by calling them names. You don't educate people by when they have a question or they have a thought by yelling at them because they should know. You explain in a way that's tactful and in a way that effectively communicates the message. And so uh, I think that's really what it's about. Now, we, we take something like uh, universal health care, which is really socialistic health care. Yeah. You say, but, you know, don't you want people to, you know, to have access to, well, yeah, absolutely. I want people, I would like every, I want to live in a society where every citizen has as access to top quality health care that's affordable and that's in abundance. And you're not going to get that through a socialistic type of system. Well, people say so. So are you saying then that our present system is, is correct? 
Well, no, I'm not saying that either. See, that's the either or. Right, it's right. either the current capitalistic system of, of, of health care or the... We do not have a capitalistic system of health care. We have not had a capitalistic system of health, a free market system of health care for 50 years. And the more government has gotten involved, the more it's driven prices up, it's, it's, it's decreased the amount, it has absolutely messed up the health care system. Let's go back 50 years, 55 years, which isn't really that long ago, and principles don't change. Okay? When doctor's offices in the early 60s, mid-60s, um, there wasn't, it wasn't like Grand Central Station. You could actually get an appointment with your doctor in a reasonable period of time. Doctors made health uh, house calls. Uh, typically, they, they charged a, a, a sliding scale for people who couldn't afford it, and there were always clinics going on and different to take care of those who really couldn't help. Every major uh, city had a charity hospital, and you know what? Whenever someone really needed help and the family couldn't afford it, people always chipped in. Mm -hmm. We li live in a very charitable society when we're actually allowed to keep enough of our money so that we can do what we want with it, as opposed to working till, till May to pay our taxes to a bunch of bureaucrats who are redistributing that money, sometimes from good intent, which usually goes bad, but often because their decisions and legislation has been bought and paid for by the lobbyists who are representing other interests, which right. aren't ours. Yeah. Okay. And like my friend Michael Cloud says, it's not the abuse of power that's the problem, that's the result. The, the, the problem is the power to abuse. Because we don't make our Congress people enact or legislate within the chains of the Constitution, they're able to do all these things that they have no business doing. Uh, government doesn't have rights. Individuals have rights. Governments have powers, strictly enumerated powers of things that they can do. So. If, it, if they weren't allowed to operate outside the chains of the Constitution, it wouldn't matter how many lobbyists are on K Street or whatever street they're on, they would have no influence to be able to change in, in rules, and people would be free to live their lives, conduct business, and operate as they see fit, again, providing they don't infringe upon anybody else's right to do the same. And so it's a matter, really, of uh, getting back those liberties. It's a matter of getting the market back. And, and again, I explain a lot of that in those posts, uh, but there's, so, there's plenty of good books to, to read out there. Dr. Thomas Sowell, uh, Professor Walter Williams, uh, there, there's so many great, Larry Elder, there's so many great books out there, but we just need to know where to search to really find the, the information. Yeah, well, you know, it's so fantastic about it is that you, you've described uh, the difference between, you know, go-givers and go-takers. Go right. You know, just by that. Okay, so... Once someone is a operates as a go giver and they've tapped into that, and as you will see, most of these are within people. They just need to bring them out, just like you talked about in the Wizard of Oz. Um, now you're obviously creating tremendous value. Now, what better thing to have is than people telling other people about it? So you've got a book here called Endless Referrals. So what what will someone uh, what, what what are you teaching here? And what, what does someone get out of, uh, out of this book if they were to read it? Yeah, well, Endless Referrals, and that's the first book, and, and people have said, well, that should have been your last book. The first one should have been The Go-Giver, uh -huh. because that's the con conceptual idea. Right. The Endless Referrals is really the, the, the how-to system of how to um, really build, find, cultivate relationships in which people know you, like you, trust you, want to do business with you, want to refer you to others. You know, Joe, the two major problems people, most people have in business, good markets, bad markets, and, you know, whatever. I mean, I always say you cannot control the economy, but you can absolutely control your economy. Right. And you do that by finding the correct ways to provide value to others who are in the market to buy what you are selling. And so what this, you know, the two biggest challenges, one, it's, it's the, the amount of grunt work it takes to get to the decision maker, okay? You know, we spend 80% of our time over here, 20% of our time around those people who can say yes. These are the people, these people, the 20% of the people you can serve with your great exceptional value. They're the ones who want to do business with you. They desire to do business with you. They're qualified to do business with you. And then and, and, and through the system in the book, we take you to, so you're spending now 80% of your time over here and 20% of your time with the grunt work, which of course is still part of life, it's still part of business. The other is, you know, it's the people who say, well, who do I talk to next now that my original list of names is running out? Because when you go through that list, 
And you think, oh gosh, if I'm working with a, a finite list of people, finite list of names, which you're not, but we might think we are, then every time somebody tells me no, I'm one step closer to being out of business. Then you get in front of someone who will allow you to present to them, and now everything's off. You know, I mean, you, you, you try to fake it like you have that posture. Right? Right, right, right. And I define posture, by the way, as when you care, but not that much. <laughs> okay. and in other words, it's a lack of emotional attachment to a specific desire. That's hysterical, actually. And yeah, in the morning, I can see that in the dating world too. Right, you're right. Positive. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't want to go out with me, would you? Right. You know. It's a, and so, <laughs> no, I wouldn't. And so, you know, it's that it's that whole posture. It's right. that confidence. And so, um, and, and really, you have that posture by having a huge list of A-list, high-quality people to whom you can speak because then you care, but not that much. When that person says no, it's very easy for you to say next. Now you want to have humble posture, you know, you not arrogant, you don't when the person says no, you know, or you know, feel their person say you don't say next out loud. Right. You say to yourself and you're willing to move on. When you're willing to say next, you actually become more attractive to that person. What's this person got their hands on that's so good that they don't care that I'm not interested? And maybe they are interested now, but maybe they're not. But if you can have that kind of posture with one person, you can duplicate that. But yes. here's the thing. The amount of posture you'll have and the amount of posture you'll display is directly proportional to how many A-list, high-quality names you have on your list. Yeah. And that's really what this book helps you to do, have awesome. that huge list. Awesome. And that's marketing. That's positioning. And that's, well, how do people uh, find out more about you? I mean, your website's on Berg.com. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm going to recommend that uh, everyone uh, watching, if you resonate with any of uh, what we've discussed, which uh, if you're still watching, that means you do, uh, <laughs> where do they get more of your, your training? If, if they go to Berg.com, B-U-R-G.com, uh, they can subscribe if they like to the free goodies, mm -hmm. which are four reports that are very value-based. And they can also connect with me on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. They can go to the blogs, and they can, but they can also download Chapter 1 of The Go-Giver, Go give or sell more and endless referrals to see if they do resonate with the writing style and the way it's written. And if they do, then they can tap, they can uh, click through mm -hmm. to um, Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Or the Go Giver is pretty much in Go Give or Sell More still at any of your local bookstores. Endless referrals is still at some of them, but not not always. Awesome. Uh, you know what? Any any famous less words? No, nope, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate being. You know, you've been a, a hero of mine for a long time. We've Thank never you. gotten to you know to meet. I've had the pleasure of meeting Dan Kennedy, spoken on his platform a, a couple of times, but I, I've not gotten to meet you. And just kind of getting to hang around with you for a while has has really been a pleasure. So thank you. Yeah, th you know, and one thing I got to say is like yesterday, uh, I was talking to one of my very great clients who's been literally with me for uh, over a decade, and I was talking to her, and. Um, she um, she said to me, she goes, you know, I, I, I just read a great book, and I want to send it to you. And I'm like, well, what's the book? You know, because I always like, you know, last thing I need is another book. I have a million <laughs> books. And she's like, well, it's called Go Give Her Cell Word. I go, this is, so, I, I swear to God, this is true. I go, well, I'm, I'm interviewing Bob Berg tomorrow. And she's like, it figures. She's like, you know everybody. And, uh, and I was like, I, I said to her, I go, her name's Carrie. I, I said, isn't this really weird that we, you just told me this? I mean, I've, I've interviewed by it. So, yes, I've been totally looking forward to doing the interview you. with you. And, and so many people uh, over the years have, have, like, either sent me your book, told me about you, wanted to connect us, that sort of thing. And so Christy, who works with you, she mm -hmm. set it up. And uh, so it's been a pleasure. And this has been fantastic. And Thank so you. I want to I want to encourage uh, all of the uh, viewers and listeners, uh, go get a copy of uh, both The Go-Giver and Go-Givers uh, Sell More. I th and read the chapter, like you said, at Berg.com. And, and follow Bob's stuff. I, I think not only will you learn a lot that will be profitable, but uh, I think it will, in a lot of ways, uh, change your life. And I think it's uh, something that you're going to want to share with your kids. If, you have, if you're a business owner and you have employees that are in sales positions, which pretty much all of them are, I would encourage you to, to, to get copies of the books for them and just uh, spread it around because anyone that is a, a hero to capitalism is, is one of my heroes. And so thank you so thank you. much. I appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot.